Now, the experiences of those affected by forced migration are different from one another. But one thing they all have in common is a desire to live, a desire to survive. The yearning to stay alive transcends the conventional, whether it's making perilous journeys through international waters on an inflatable vessel, or making other perilous journeys through international borders um, undocumented, or staying in host countries despite rejection and prejudice. That desire to live, that resilience, is what has compelled millions of people around the world to take desperate measures to not only guarantee their survival, but oftentimes that of their families too. Up until the age of nine, one could say that I had a good childhood. My parents had worked very hard to isolate me from the unpleasant realities of growing up in Colombia. For years, Colombia has experienced civil conflict between left-wing guerrilla insurgents, the military backed by the government, and right-wing paramilitary groups financed by landowners, corrupt politicians, and other private interest groups, not to mention drug cartels and other criminal groups. Now, in Colombia, social mobility is something that is really difficult. What this means is that if you're born poor, you die poor. Climbing the social ladder is literally impossible. But my parents accomplished just that, just what was considered impossible. Through hard work, they were able to buy a nice home in what was considered a well-off part of town. But some of our neighbors didn't like that, and they resorted to labeling us as insurgents in order to take away our home and expel us from the community. Now, when we brought these complaints forward to local authorities, what started off as a simple complaint to City Hall soon turned into a political persecution. And for the next two years, we moved around for two years, looking for safety and find safe haven, find safe haven for all of us. We left our home after a kidnapping attempt against me, actually. And we became part of the 3.5 million people that became displaced as a result of this civil conflict. It was their power and intimidation, a city councilor, actually, who had links to drug cartels and the emerald trade. That's how it all started. Now, the last straw was when some men stormed the last place that we were staying in. This is the one place. Uh, now, we don't know whether these people had any connections to the peoples that had persecuted us for the previous two years, but the evidence they left behind suggests that they were, tar that they were targeting us, for they took all information that was related to our documentation, our addresses, and anything to find us later on. But we were lucky not to be home that night. And as improbable as this may sound, I attribute our departure that night to my mother's premonition that something was going to happen to us that day, that our lives were going to end. And I still recall her pleas for help. It is a night that I'll never forget. Now, for many people that leave through forced migration, uh, fleeing under political asylum isn't easy because oftentimes you need proof to corroborate your story. So that was our intention, to flee for the U.S. and then claim pol uh, political asylum. So we only took three suitcases and barely any pictures from my childhood. And that's the one reason why I only have a few images as I was growing up. But thanks to, American, uh, thanks to American immigration, we were granted temporary asylum and we would stay in the U.S. for the next three years. Now, as I'm telling my story, I'm also going to be making a few arguments as to why higher income countries stand to benefit from taking in refugees, asylum seekers, and other migrants. And the one reason is because there is an aging population phenomena occurring in higher income countries. There is a lot of old people. The reason for that is because, well, there are many reasons, but one of the main reasons is because baby boomers are retiring. Now, this is a generation that was born following World War II between roughly 19, uh, 1946 and 1964. And now that they're going to be retiring, more resources are going to be required in order to fund many of the social services and healthcare benefits that we have nowadays. There will also be a substantial decrease in uh, tax revenue. And this is, a, this is a phenomenon occurring in whole all high-income countries. The Conference Board of Canada estimates that we'll need to attract around 350,000 migrants per year to sustain our economy. And Canada is currently taking in 260,000 people. And I argue that high-income countries stand to benefit from taking in resilient and hardworking immigrants 
that can guarantee the survival of the economies and prohibit and avoid the fall of the population. Now, living in a foreign country uh, can be difficult and challenging, and I think some of you can relate to this. Uh, there is oftentimes cultural and language barriers that one has to overcome. Although I gotta tell you, living in Miami made that transition much easier because basically everyone spoke Spanish. It actually took me over a month to find someone that spoke English outside of the airport. So that was a really nice transition, a really nice transition. But only then I just realized that our journey had just begun. There was word that poultry slaughterhouses would hire anyone regardless of their ethnicity or their legal status. So we made the move to Mississippi, in the deep American South, where we would settle for the next three years. Now, I could tell you all about the, hor the horrific working conditions at places like this for both animals that are mistreated and for employees who are only paid and exploited for no more than $200 a week. But I recommend you watch the documentary Footing by Robert Kenner for more details. Now, although the nature of their jobs was not glamorous, my parents were determined to work hard, as many other immigrants around the world have shown through their resilience when they adapt to working in new countries. Now, time for lesson number two. So, uh, this is uh, a case study. Uh, in Canada, uh, between 1971 and 1981, the country accepted roughly 60,000 so-called boat people from Southeast Asia. And within a decade, 86% of refugees were working, had healthy lifestyles, and spoke English with some proficiency. These people were well more likely to have jobs than the average Canadian, and one in five was self-employed. Not to mention the fact that uh, many of these uh, became reliable taxpayers, so they were not a drain on the, on the taxpayer, they were taxpayers. And worldwide, local populations have benefited in 19 out of the, out of the 20 industrialized nations as a result of immigration. Anyways, getting back to my story. So um, in Mississippi, uh, there were both challenges, and, uh, but also living there was rewarding, as you can tell from some of the science fair projects and things that I was working on. But uh, uh, whether it was uh, being embroiled in, in the racial tensions of the deep American South or just adjusting to everyday, to everyday life, it was something that we had to contend with. But the financial and uh, psychological stress that my parents endured was great. But I still remember the quotes of inspiration by my mother to motivate us to work hard. One of them was, whatever is gained, whatever is worth in life is gained through hard work. And it was this short inspirational quote that allowed them to keep working and find that resilience to move forward and move ahead. And soon, my dad found a uh, job that was closer to his field in dairy farming, to be precise, that's number 27 over there. Really nice cow, by the way. And uh, so that's how we're able to qualify for a skilled worker visa to come to Canada. And three years later, we arrived here. Now, um, unlike many Im immigrants, we actually moved to a rural Canada, not a big city. We did move to Calgary first, but then we settled in uh, the BC interior. And I became subject to uh, much racial discrimination and prejudice as a result of my Colombian background. Believe it or not, I actually didn't know what cocaine was until I came to Canada. <laughs> it wasn't until another greatest student asked me if I had some cocaine on me that I, I said, wait, what? I mean, but anyways, I became so ashamed of, <laughs> I became so ashamed of where I was from that I no longer told people where I, was, where I came from. And, uh, but I wanted to fit in, but you know what? I mean, when, you, when you're in, in a town of 15,000 people and you're the only Latin American in your school, then fitting in becomes a bit of a challenge. Now, as I was mentioning and as I keep saying throughout my talk, it was this resilience to work hard and move ahead in society that my parents kept working and finally allowed us to improve our standard of living. But to this day, my parents still work very labor-intensive jobs. In the case of my father, for instance, even though he's a trained uh, animal scientist and he went to university for 10 years, he still works in a very, in a very labor-intensive setting. But unlike the stereotype of many refugees and asylum seekers and migrants around the world, we have never been a burden on the social services system. And that is a trend that I've seen worldwide. My parents have always wanted to work hard. Now, one of the reasons that my father is also continuing to work in this laboring job in Texas setting is because of the lack of institutional willingness to allow immigrants 
to recognize their foreign credentials. And this is another barrier that many immigrants around, around the world continue to face. But at the, end, at the end of the day, I'm extremely grateful to be in a country where I can express myself free from fear, free from uh, persecution and retribution for saying what I think. And not, this is also one thing that I like, that I like to notice, that uh, not all of our experiences were negative. Quite the contrary, there were people that opened their homes and that uh, welcomed us in their communities. And these are people that I still cherish to this day. So the way that you treat a newcomer to your community, whether it's a fellow student or someone, a recent immigrant, it can have a significant impact on the, on the rest of, real, of their lives and on the, on, the view that, on, the, on the way that they view your country. Now, one more thing that I like to notice that um, what my sibling and I have accomplished is further highlights, it further highlights the, what migrants can bring to society. Through little resources, we're both able to accomplish post-secondary education with a lot of student debt, though. Uh, we're able to uh, gain experience in various fields and are now following the path of entrepreneurship. In my case, I turned my passion into change by starting a project here at UBC, actually, where I've aimed to create workshops, uh, writing, and do video features to address many of today's socioeconomic and environmental issues. But unfortunately, a lot of the rhetoric around migrants and taking in refugees and asylum seekers isn't focused on the benefits that they can bring to society, rather on how much they cost to society. And I think that's a rhetoric that needs to change. Now, Canadian business editor-in-chief James Cohen actually agrees, and he says, quote, don't properly bring in refugees into our country isn't about charity, it's about investing in the future, both theirs and ours. A study by McLean's Magazine study found that increasing refugees by a factor of 20 would cost the Canadian economy around $2.2 billion. Now, it sounds like a lot, but it's only $63 per Canadian. Not to mention the fact that these are people that are hardworking and resilient, so they'll, they'll eventually pay back that initial investment that the country gave for them. Now, although my story has been able to, sh to shed some light on both the experiences that migrants can face when they arrive to a new country, and also how uh, developed countries stand to benefit from taking in such refugees. Migrants can benefit their host countries, but political rhetoric isn't always the most accurate. And there are many ways that they can benefit where they establish themselves, whether, whether it's combating the aging population phenomena, uh, also through their individual economic contributions, or increasing in labor supply and GDP growth. There are plenty of reasons as to why high-income countries stand to benefit from taking in refugees, asylum seekers, and other migrants. But to me, it all comes down to the moral imperative that we as a society have to help one another in times of needs and crisis. Now, just imagine for a second that this were your brother, your sister, your mother, your father. What if he was your friend? It helps to put things into perspective, right? At the end of the day, I wish that we're all guided by a moral compass to help one another, which should be taken into account when we lead our everyday lives and when policymakers make decisions. Helping others doesn't mean that we're giving up on our own opportunities. What I'm trying to tell you now is that giving people fleeing adversity the chance to build a new life will not only enhance their lives, but will benefit their host countries economically and in their cultural vibrancy. Thank you.